meet my guest as we look into the various aspects of the budget, the Ajinkwa budget. My guest, I've got two Johns in the studio. Dr. John Amponchia Kuma, he's MP Ejusu and Deputy Minister for Finance. John Abdullahi Jinapo is MP Yape Kusogu and member Finance Committee of Parliament. Joining us via Zoom, Dr. Theo Echampong, economist and political risk analyst. In the course of the program, we'll be joined by Seth Chum Akwabwa, Chief Executive Officer, Association of Ghana Industries, AGI. Dr. Edward Aka Nyameke, Jr., President, Ghana Hotels Association and MD of Venaco Lodge. Professor Solomon Nunu, UTAC National President and Dean, Office of Research, Innovation and Consultancy, UMAT Takwa, and John Ewa, another John, third John for the day. John Ewa, Chief Executive Officer, Ghana Association of Banks. They will all give us their perspectives, what hopes they derive from the budget, or what needs to be done with the budget as far as their special areas or sectors are concerned. Gentlemen, good morning and welcome to News File. Good morning. Right. Theo, good morning. <laughs> so let's test uh, Theo's uh, Zoom. Hello. Okay, so Dr. Theo Champong should join us uh, later. Let's uh, listen to the finance minister briefly on the abolishing of tolls, uh, on the e-levy, and then on road construction, and a few other things he had to say. After considerable deliberation, government has decided to place a levy on all electronic transactions to widen the tax levy. Mr. Speaker, electronic transactions covering, mo covering mobile money payments. Mr. Speaker. Honourable members, order, order. Electronic mobile money payments, bank transfers, merchant payments, and e-mode remittances will be charged at an applicable rate of 1.75%, which will be borne by the sender, except inward remittances, which will be borne by the recipient. Mr. Speaker, to safeguard efforts be made to enhance financial inclusion and protect the vulnerable, all transactions that add up to 100 Ghana CDs or less per day, which is approximately 3,000 Ghana cities per month, will be exempt from this levy. As at the end of September 2021, routine maintenance was carried out on 21,165 kilometers of the trunk road network, 6,265 kilometers of the feeder road network, and 2,937 kilometers of the urban road network. Mr. Speaker, development works progressed steadily on several major projects. The Pokwa Interchange under the Accra Urban Transport Project, which involved the construction of a four-tier interchange, the only one in Africa, construction of 12 kilometers of selected roads, segregated walkways, footbridges, underpasses, and drainage structures was completed and commissioned on July 9, 2021. Over the years, stalling points, besides resting, creating these inconveniences, also leads to pollution in and around the vicinities. To address these challenges, government has abolished all tolls on public roads and bridges. This takes effect immediately the budget is approved on appropriation. The toll collection 
personnel, the toll collection personnel will be reassigned, the expected impact on productivity and reduce environmental pollution will more than offset the revenue foregone by removing the tolls. The youth employment challenge, as well as extensive consultations of stakeholders, including youth associations and educational institutions across the country, initiative, which proposes to use one billion Ghana cities each year. Proposes to use one billion Ghana cities each year to catalyze an ecosystem to create one million jobs and in partnership with the financial institutions and develop partner and development partners raise another two billion Ghana cities over the three year period. So that's the finance minister Ken Oforiata. Um, he labeled the budget a Jinkwa budget, but it was under the theme building a sustainable entrepreneurial nation. What does that mean, building an entrepreneurial nation? Fiscal consolidation, if we are not careful, maybe soon we'll hit the trillion. Uh, is that where we are heading? How are we stopping it? He says we we'll walk away from the debt. Job creation, um, they put in one billion uh, targeted at one million uh, jobs. Is that all there is? But what have we seen about previous such, you know, uh, packages for job creation? How can we do better in this one? So let me begin by inviting preliminary comments, very brief from my guests. Um, need is inspiring is how to recover from COVID. Some have asked, what exactly has COVID done to <clears throat> the Ghanaian state that it hasn't done to neighboring countries which have not, you know, accumulated as much as we are doing and are not complaining as much as we are doing? US of News Farm, uh, let me send a special greetings to one special voice I always hear on News Farm that uh, <laughs> I've missed so much, the Uncle Kwakubako. Right. Uh, well, uh, the Argentine budget. Kuku is on his sleeve. He resumes. <laughs> the Argentine budget is one of the inspiring budgets um, that, uh, for me, Ghana needs at this particular time. And the focus, uh, as has been espoused, is to help Ghana transition <laughs> for, from the socialist welfare mentality state of. Uh, government do for us, government do for us, to a more entrepreneurial uh, uh, state where we empower young people to become creative. Financial resources and allocation being made for young people in terms of the quantum to be able to create jobs for themselves and to also sustain in terms of the... Uh, it's one thing putting it on paper, it's another translating it yeah, on the ground. Yes, but previously we had not even put it on paper. So this is the first time I've seen the extent of the commitment. And I believe that we are more than committed to translate that in terms of its implementation and, and also bringing on board the banks and the financial institutions, not just a separate government uh, intervention. But this time around, what one unique thing about that we are negotiating, which eventually we may sign a compact with, so that we agree for them to lend these resources to these young people under specific terms and conditions, including the interest rate not exceeding a certain percentage, the requirement for certain uh, collateral and security arrangement. All those things are going to be varied mm -hmm. so that we can really see the impact of this project and also the involvement of various investors. We are not just going to have a central arrangement. Government is going to make sure we disperse some of these resources to the various campuses so that whilst you're on campus, it should even be easy for you to apply within your university to tap into these resources. Hold to the key issue of job creation in the country and creating sustainable econ economic opportunities for young people. Mm -hmm. But also most importantly, is the fiscal targeting of this budget, ensuring we achieve fiscal consolidation and debt sustainability, because that is also something that have been of a worry to so many followers of our budget, 
and how so when you the finance people say fiscal consolidation what do you mean we mean we, we mean that okay so let me use figures so that you understand it better mm. in 2020 for instance and that's what we talk about covid we the the, the volume of our deficit fiscal deficit was about 15 percent because government revenue uh, were short of about 11.7 billion then extra on plan expenditures of about 14.6 billion so y y there was a gap of about 25.5 billion okay that shot the deficit to about 15 percent now in 2021 mm. we went 0.4 percent okay so what that tells you is that gradually we are bringing down the over expenditure and that's the fiscal consolidation that's what we mean trying to reduce spending above your earnings mm. okay and then also the debt sustainability every time you post a negative primary balance it means that you are adding on to your debt and in this 2022 budget we are seeing a positive primary balance of 0.1 percent that means that gradually instead of increasing your debt you are reducing it and, and and that is reflected even in the external financing that we are seeking in the 2022 budget whilst in 2021 we want for we went for about three billion euro bond and this is the debt of course you cannot achieve all instantly and government projections to restore fiscal responsibility act of not spending above five percent may be achieved even before the 2024 target okay so that is the position of the budget when we say we fiscal. want to achieve fiscal responsibility uh, sorry fiscal, fiscal consolidation. consolidation and debt mm. sustainability and the budget address these concerns okay uh, debt sustainability at the same time you are talking about debt sustainability and the minister uses you know it says we will we are going to um, judiciously walk away yeah. uh, from the debts you yeah. have three four one point seven six billion yes uh, that's debt, debt debt to gdp ratio of seven seven point five percent yes this clearly yes. there is no one even the francophone countries in africa whose debt were around 35 percent of gdp has risen to 65 percent of gdp in terms of averages and ghana was at 61 percent of uh, debt to GDP in 2019 before COVID struck and we jumped to 76 percent so clearly COVID has made a huge difference uh, in for, terms forgive of me this is supposed to be your preliminary yeah. but I still need a bit of understanding of this okay. when when the refrain mm. is repeated uh, refrain repeated that's yeah. uh, like uh, <laughs> tautology but what do you mean by what COVID has done? What exactly did COVID do? COVID dealt to the state. a huge negative blow to the state. And not China, forty feet Ghana is an, a net import country. Mm. A forty feet container we used to bring to Ghana at three thousand dollars in December, last just twenty twenty December, is now thirteen thousand dollars as of today. The same forty feet container, just the freight. You are talking about just the freight. And so today, if you go to the U.S., food that used to be sold at $29 is about $50. And everybody, Canada, U.K., U.K. is complaining of a three-decade inflation level they've never seen, 4.1%. America has jumped to 6.8%. But what those countries you have just cited yes. did for their citizens in COVID, Ghana didn't do a quarter of that. In our capacity, we did very well. Yes. Free food. Uh, please. We serve food for how many weeks? Okay. So in the US, mm. they created $1.9 trillion to show up the economy. That's okay? right. And of course, once you have $1.9 trillion, you'll be able to do more. In Ghana, we couldn't have created anything. <laughs> you couldn't just, hand checks to we, people like exactly. the US. Exactly. In the midst of the resources that we had, we managed to feed millions of people. We managed to provide electricity, free electricity and free water for a period of three or six months. Okay, we had to increase a lot of supply of PPPs, uh, PPEs, PPEs, PPEs mm. to a number of schools and hospitals and even increase incentives to health sector workers. All this came at a very huge cost to, to that lost his job. Mm. And if you, if you check, so COVID 
even the private sector teaches how to lose their jobs. So many workers, there was a lockdown. Mm. Workers had to sit home. Yeah. So if somebody says, what has COVID done? COVID has done a lot of negative and, 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 and the first time, okay, mm. Ghana almost went into a recession, 0.4% of growth. And all our neighbors, those uh, our friends referred to, it was an average of negative 2.5%, the regional ECOWAS average. And Ghana did a positive 0 0.4. Okay, thank you. So clearly... You have all this right there for yes. us. Thank you. Uh, John, um, we have heard some of the commentary from the minority, um, an interesting minority. <laughs> the parliament is divided right there in the middle, and yet, legally, the terminology has to be minority. Um, the budget doesn't seem to excite you at all. I am thinking, why one billion to create a million jobs in the campaign? What was President Ma perspective. You don't do economic analysis just out of the blue. You situate it and do the discussion within that context. And for me, that is very, very important. You just mentioned about Tampa case. Mm -hmm. This was announced in November 2020. It's a three-year program, 2021, 2022, 2023. They expect to disburse $100 billion. We've done about one year today. So the first question is, how much have we disbursed within one year? And what have we achieved within that one year? That is what will give you an indication mm. whether this is empty sloganeering or they really mean business. I've read the 2022 budget, and the minister is here. Let him tell us how much they have disbursed out of this 100 billion mm. and what has it achieved how many jobs has that created what do you know i have checked i can't see anything he's here that's why i'm happy he's here let him I refer us to the paragraphs where they have disbursed those monies because we are interested and that's where the issue of primary balance comes if you go and borrow deep discount bonds you don't pay the interest every year unlike a plain vanilla bond but at the end of the period, the difference between the amount you borrowed and the future value, that difference is huge. And that is the interest component of it. Because interest is like the cost of money. But you see, let's ask ourselves, is this economy healthy or not? That is the key issue. Are we in crisis or not? Because in one breath, government tells us, oh, things are difficult. In another breath, they tell us, oh, we've made a, a turn around. The economy is on a sound footing. Everything is all right. We can't blow hot as well up to this point. I'm interested in this. If it were in some other hands, maybe we don't know where we would have find ourselves. That's what they are saying. So you compare yourself to your peers. That's all. If you want to tell us that you've done well, compare yourself to your peers. Joy Multimedia will not go and compare itself to my radio station in Bupi. Because you are within a certain category. So I expect you to be comparing yourself with your peers, not with USA. Look at Cote d'Ivoire, look at Senegal, look at Ethiopia, look at Kenya, look at even Nigeria. They were all affected by COVID. Nobody is discounting the impact of COVID. We are saying to what extent and how did you respond to those challenges? There's an overall budget balance. That budget balance is what determines how much you spent and how much you raised in terms of revenue. Cote d'Ivoire did 5.6% because of COVID. Burkina Faso, 5.7%. Nigeria, 5.8%. Nigeria, about 80% of their foreign nation income is based on oil. Oil plant, 07 That is the reality. The reality is that because of election-related expenditure, we spend like there was no tomorrow. And today, we are in a quagma. This economy is in tatters. And you want to blame COVID for all these challenges. Why would you overspend by 15.7%? Who does that? No country did that within this sub-region. They fed the poor who could not They also afford. fed the poor. I they have they at gave free electricity, he said, and then water. I have looked at Cote d'Ivoire's situation. That's why he says fiscal consolidation. It means you ought to manage your economy with prudence. When you are taking decisions today, you must know that there is tomorrow. You can't decide that you want to spend everything in 2020 and then turn around and raise your hand and say, I overspent, I overspent. So come and pay. Then you shouldn't have given me the water. 
if you are to give me water today and tomorrow and the days after, you're going to hit my stomach, draining Ghanaians, and Ghanaians are having it. But you see, well, but there are those who are saying that we, we are even paying for what was given for free. We are overpaying. Because of the covered levy and the We are coming there. Mm. I'm sure we'll get there. But you see, when you are doing this analysis, you must look at 2021 before you even go to 2022. In 2021, this government told us that we should tighten our belts and sacrifice. They called it consolidating, gaining, all kinds of terminologies here and there. So all salary workers, we had an increment of 4%. That's what happened, 4% against a current inflation rate of 11%. You know what it means? The minister decided that we should pay COVID recovery levy. That's what he told us. It increased by 40%, the NHI, that we should pay that money so that they will accumulate that money and help with the economy recovery process. Despite these increments that I talk of, the minister then said the financial sector, we needed to pay another 5% on their gross profit. All the banks, all yeah. the funds, yes. Yeah. Then he says that we should pay what he calls energy sector recovery levy, 20%. That flat rate was increased. He brought in sanitation levy. This alone led to a fuel ex pump price at the pump by 13% instantly. Then they increased the price stabilization recovery levy, 40%. Bust margin, 200%. Fuel marking, 233%. UPPF, 164%. These are the sacrifices the ordinary Ghanaian made in the 2021. All these sacrifices, the economy was going to stabilize. Debt to GDP was stabilized. All those issues were stabilized. Almost one year down the lane, what has happened? That is the critical question for me. After all, look, the Ghanaian is sacrificed so much. Mm, almost one year down, COVID is still there. That is why they say we should pay a COVID recovery levy. Mm. That's why they say, look, your salaries will only increase by 4% against a rate of inflation of currently 11%. Our borders remain close, right? They knew our all that. land borders. Look, I didn't say that. The minister said, our borders are close. COVID affected us. We had a deficit of 15%. So do all this so that we'll recover. So you agree commerce has been greatly affected? Gravely affected. You agree? Now let's go to the commerce. Oil price was benchmark it at 54. In the budget, and I refer to page 32, paragraph 144, mm. oil prices has increased by 60.4%. We are making a huge windfall with oil revenue. It's in your budget. Cocoa, the price has increased by 3.8%. The volume, because your revenue is a function of price and quantity, has increased by 32%. Gold price has increased by 41%. Finished products, the importation, has increased by 41.6%. So they are making where the monies went to. You see, you can spend, but if you don't spend in the productive sectors of the economy, you are going to have a major, major problem. And one of the productive sectors of the economy is capital expenditure. Mm. If you look at our capital expenditure, between 2013 to 2016, as a percentage of GDP, is 15.45. The MPP's capital expenditure over the past four years is 7.3%. And yet you've increased our debt from 120 to 341 billion. So this budget, this is why the budget doesn't inspire you? This is why we are in this quagma. That is the I, first I thing I want the to specific establish. The, the specific now, let's I go to the specific uh, project of uh, 1 billion from 1 million jobs. I just explained to you. What's your that response to that? It is mere rhetoric because the minister told us about this in November 2020. We are in November. It's one year since he told us that. A three year program. We've done one year. We are left with two years. So, out of that three years, this one year, how many of those jobs have we created? Rather, we ask you're NAPCO. You're familiar with NAPCO? We ask NAPCO mm. uh, 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 employees to go home. After they agitated and there was a brouhaha, they then asked them to come back. They go and check the NAPCO budget. 
it reduced from 800 to 600. All right. And yeah. this year, 2022, that they say they will employ more. Hmm. It has reduced further to 520 million. Okay, thank you. Just hold it, the hold it there. Of the hold economy. it there, and let me pick very brief uh, perspectives from our other guests. Um, is Dr. Shue Champong on with us now? Yes. Uh, yes, good morning. Throughout and reading uh, the budget uh, statements. It's difficult for some of us to read. We have to read and some pages and paragraphs. We have to read over and again before we can understand. It's not like uh, reading a legislation. So <laughs> is there hope in this budget? Um, the, the budget is mixed back. And I think to sum up what the situation is, listening to both uh, John and uh, the other John, the deputy minister, if you look at paragraph 321 on page 75 of the budget, and I will read that, Mr. Speaker, to sum up, so this is after the government had given all the realize that, which require radical measures. So let us all embrace these new policies to enable government to address, and I quote another one, the fundamental issues affecting the economy to ensure that our nation continues to remain or maintain, sorry, its position as the black star of the continent. I think for me, that practically sums up where we are as a country, that even the government acknowledges quite clearly, and this is not me saying it, that things are challenging, and um, the, both the impact of the pandemic, but before that, because I have appeared on your platform a couple of times that I highlighted that the challenges that we're having with this economy predate performance, effectiveness of spending, all of those things um, have still largely not been um, significantly addressed. But of course, COVID, COVID to an extent then compounded it. Mm. So, so from where I sit, if I take this statement in paragraph 321, and then you ask yourself, what are the fundamental issues affecting the economy? And to what extent does the budget then address it? I have about six things that I quickly hi uh, highlight. One is the issue of weak diversification, and many of us on this platform would agree that the economy is still reliant on practically three primary commodities, oil, gold, and cocoa. Number two, we have some economic growth, but there is no jobs, or there are no quality jobs, so significant underemployment and unemployment. Number three, we have low productivity, and this is basically a function also of the structure of the economy which is largely informal so 80 to 90 percent of our employment or the workforce comes from this informal sector and by some estimates almost 40 percent of output so gdp has been struggling to balance the books and so you then need to see some aggressive fiscal consolidation or trying to basically ensure that you don't find yourself in a dark trap number five uh, it's still the same taxpayers, so the same quote and unquote formal sectors of people who are paying taxes, and in this case, even the e levy probably being asked to pay more. And then, number six, the, from the, the, the problem also is that there seems to be over the years a lot of emphasis on revenue generation, but very little on the expenditure side of the equation to show us where these monies are being utilized, how they are being spent, and the productive and allocative efficiencies, as we economists like to put it, you know, on that, in that respect. So this is how I look at the 2022 budget in the light of these fundamental that, that needs to be done in that regard. But the point really is that we're not in ordinary times, and the government itself quite clearly states that we're in challenging times. Yes, we are in challenging times, and he says we require, which require radical measures. Your verdict is that this is the Ajimko budget that he talks about. Is this really what he says it is? I, I don't think it's an Ajimko budget. So I, I feel there are interventions there. We can get to the specifics, some of which attempt to address some of the issues. And then there are others still there that, in, from my or where I sit, um, there are is challenges with that. So, for example, in the 2021 budget, um, when the sanitation levy, COVID levy, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, 
as we speak currently in this 2022 budget there is no mention i don't see it i could be corrected of how much have been collected in or from those levies number one and number two what those monies have been used for but at the same time there are a raft of new you know tax instruments that are being proposed in this 22 budget so you i see a bit of a disconnect where it looks as though we want to implement more revenue raising measures fine mm. but i don't see any um, accountability in terms of some of the past initiatives that have been announced and to what extent with a government that is trying to tax its way into prosperity all governments since i started looking at or following the ghanaian economy unfortunately have found taxation as the easy way out rather than or revenue raising let me put it that way rather than addressing the elephant in the room which also is on the expenditure side of of the equation and value for money so specifically in this case what you see quite clearly in terms of continuity is an attempt to tax and an attempt to tax which in my view does not support um this is uh, chuma kwabwa chief executive officer association of ghana industries adi um how do you read this budget the finance minister has finished reading it how do you read it well thank you very much um for us in, in industry we look at it from different angles first of all we are very interested in what happens in the macroeconomic environment because if you don't have a stable macroeconomic environment, it impacts on planning, it impacts on businesses. We are also concerned about issues regarding the level of debt that is confronting us, because the debt has to be financed. How are you going to finance it? Financing it through international you know, bonds and all that, uh, they also have implications because you continue to pile up your debt stock. So we are interested in that angle as well. Besides, uh, once you continue to have accumulated debt, uh, you must necessarily survive. So tax levels will also be increasing, and new development will always come in, and it has an effect on the private sector. So we are interested in that aspect as well. But we are also very interested in measures to improve industrial development, because we also believe that the long-term uh, development is key for, for Ghanaian industries and for, for our revenue generation. And uh, uh, if you remember what the uh, Dr. Tiwa Champon said, said we are been experiencing growth, but the growth to me is tiny. But that growth should translate into jobs. And we think that where you really need to can, you can really create the jobs is through industry and agriculture. Uh, service industry is important; they are a, a, a critical part of the development. But you need a service in industry that links with industrial development. So when you put everything together, uh, uh, we, we, we see some positives in this budget. We see good plans. The challenge we've always had is how do we ensure that the uh, good plans we have can be well implemented? That is the critical challenge. In most cases, sometimes we miss some of the targets and, and where we direct resources, we are not able to effectively implement. In terms of plans and programs and ideas, I think of government that we are in challenging times and we all appreciate that. COVID has impacted, other factors have come in, so it's also impacted. But I think that there are a few issues that for industry, we were also positive about, especially regarding the, the, the review of the benchmark values, which we have been uh, complaining about for the past two years since it was implemented. And, and government says they are reviewing it uh, in respect of goods that we have local capacity to produce. So when you put it together, I would say, as you said, it's, it's a misback. We have aspects that is positive. Development goals will be achieved. It will take a little while. We'll have to struggle a little bit. But I think there are positive uh, in this budget that we need to look at. It's all about implementation and how effectively we do it. So there is a glimmer of hope for industry. Is that what you're saying? That's your verdict? Yes, there is. There is a glimmer of hope. But let me, let me quickly add that where we are, it's, it's uh, I would say, self-inflicted because we shouldn't have gotten to, uh, and I'm talking with respect to the benchmark values uh, uh, review, we shouldn't have gotten to that point. 
that policy right from the onset we thought was not a good policy. So reversing it, and it's not being a complete reverser, reversing it means that we are only bringing blood back to where we were before. So that stabilizes where you were. But I think that there are other options for that. They are talking of 800 million out of a pledge of 1 billion already. So that is really something that is awful. It all depends on how effectively we implement it. So yes, there is a glimmer of hope. Okay. But my emphasis is on the effectiveness of implementation of the ideas. All right. We'll come to interrogate your concern about the benchmark values. Uh, rather not much of a concern when, uh, for some, that is a major concern. And the question is, people thought that this was rather in favor of industrialization. Uh, Dr. Edward Acker, uh, thank you very much. President Hotels Association uh, and MD of uh, Venaco Lodge. Have your expectations been met, those of you in your industry? Thank you very much, Samson. Interesting question. Uh, I think I will write on what uh, Mr. Chum Akwabwa just said, because we are part of the AGI, and so a lot of the things he said applies to us as well. But when I zero in on the tourism and hospitality industry, which the hotel sector is part of, I would say that, you know, our industry thrives on the movement of people, and it also relies heavily on the performance of other sectors of the economy. So our expectations were captured or informed in line with that basic principle, movement, and then that's on the other side of the economy. So we actually had the opportunity to share some of these expectations with the media, including uh, your station. We acknowledged the experience we've had right on the, from the onset of the pandemic in March 2020 to date. And so we, our expectations were very measured and very modest as well. I don't, I don't understand that. You were the hardest hit across the globe. And for some of your business, completely brought on their knees. So why are your expectations measured and uh, modest? Very good, very good. The, the point is that when we went into that situation, we tried to get government support. We tried to get government to intervene. And most of our expectations were not met. And so because of that experience, decided to be careful with what we were hoping and expecting in the budget. And you would realize from the minister's opening statement that he established a clear context for this particular budget, relating it to the COVID-19 experience. A lot of the uh, introductory acts dwelt on the challenges that the COVID-19 brought. So I see it in this budget as trying to address the COVID-19 pandemic and the impact it had on the economy. And that's in line with what I said earlier on that we were very measured in our expectations because we knew that feeding uh, the masses, uh, talked about the PPEs that they provided to people, talked about the free water, which we did not enjoy. I need to add that. Uh, the free electricity for some period. So all these things we acknowledge created some challenge. And the information we have from the budget, of course, we knew earlier on that the revenues dropped in excess of about 10 billion, and then the expenditure also went high. So that creates a, a situation. So our expectations related uh, to things that will get the, our business back on track. And here, we, our focus was on transportation. Talked about movement of people. Wanted to see something related to road construction. We're interested in things related to the fuel prices. We're also interested because of the terrible traffic situation getting out of the city and the quick travel to other And so we had uh, those ones. And then we're also concerned about sanitation, especially with the levy that came in the 2020 
Kwaje wanted an update on that. We wanted to see something on security. And then we're also concerned about the disposable income. You know, our industry uh, relies on uh, the use of disposable income because most of it is leisure. And so when there's less disposable income, you don't get people venturing in, in, into that. So we wanted to see policies that would deal with uh, those disposable incomes. And of course, you know, a lot of... The minister mm -hmm. spoke about promoting tourism, art and culture. And there mm -hmm. are specific you know, things that he speaks about that is supposed to benefit you. You mm -hmm. can't see any specifics there that are in your interest. He speaks about uh, interventions that are expected to increase tourist arrivals in 2021. That's what you, you are looking forward to. By 50% over the 2020 outcome and by uh, 2023, increased jobs in the tourism and arts and culture sector by 5% and increase the sector's contribution to GDP. No, Re no, rhetoric, no, 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 I should far, say. No, far, far from that. These are all positive signs that we see in the budget. And the earlier point I was raising was just to outline the expectations we had. Because frankly, most of our expectations have been addressed in the budget. If you look at the Obatapa Cares program. Yeah, that's where you are catered for. Tell us specific, what, what is in there for you that makes you happy about this budget? I'm saying, what is in there for us is the fact that the uh, a system or structures are being created that will ensure that people move around. If you look at uh, one of the pointers there, the president launched the domestic tourism and the regional uh, is a prom promotion, which is very good and in line with the objective that uh, directed the launch. Now, you also talk about the marketing of, 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 of Ghana as a destination. That is going on and it's reaping results. They've also established a single window destination, which also have huge benefits for the industry. So, specifically with regards to the activities in the ministry or the Ghana Authority, they are very positive. And in fact, it is helping in the recovery of the, 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 the sector. So those ones here, yes, they are well captured. We wanted to go beyond that to look at some of the basics. Some of the basics, you look at security. I mean, highway robbery and all those things. You talked about uh, the road safety issue. I mean, with the, so the increase in the uh, accidents on the roads, you will want to think twice what you want. Mm. So the general poster of the ministry and the third matter is very positive, and we believe that it will help go it. We also promote tourism, and by promoting tourism, we also get a bit for the accommodation sector. He, he's, he's, he spoke about a, a target uh, in preparatory work that is ongoing and being having a target to train and certify 10,000 persons by 2023 on specific tourism and hospitality skills, including pro product knowledge, customer service, digital marketing, digital marketing. and business development, uh, have undergone training in product knowledge improvement. Um, how exactly does this, you know, uh, get you guys back on your feet? Training, you know, drivers and hospitality, people in the hospitality sector, at a time when most of them are losing their jobs because there's no work? Well, something, let me say, let me say that uh, all is not lost with the industry. A lot is going on, and the business is really picking up. And when, when you look at training of the U.S. coming to the country, so that is part of the, of the whole process. When it comes to training, you see, that is a very big gap in our industry. There's a huge, huge gap. Now, my, 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 my specific question to you is, mm. this is training on specific tourism and hospitality skills. Mm -hmm. And we know that your industry was the hardest hit. Many people lost their jobs. So we have people with the skills who are sitting home and waiting for the jobs to just come back. Why do we need to train more people with tourism skills and knowledge in tourism? Well, you could look at it from the angle that 
a lot of things have changed the system since the COVID struck. And then uh, we, we, we uh, launch of the domestic tourism to digital marketing. You realize that one of the things COVID brought was for us to realign ourselves to online marketing and online transactions and all that. And that is what this training program seeks to achieve. Do, do, you, do you know or are you able to account for the 500 who have already been trained under this program so that there's a need to spend extra and that is how to boost your sector? Because you don't see much beyond this in the budget for you, is there? No, so there is. There is. You see, first of all, I do know, even though I cannot confirm the numbers, I do know that there has been some training for car rentals association. And I also know, and I got that letter last week. We we even made the GTA on that. That the preparations for that training of uh, uh, people in the in ready to join. So yes, that is ongoing. Okay. And that is certainly certainly happening. But something, let me quickly chip in here. Uh, do that in a minute for me. Let me bring Professor Solomon Nunu of uh, UTAC sure. to to sure. hear him. One one of the things that has always been a challenge for us has been these fees and charges where the regulatory bodies and some agencies decide on their own the, 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 the adjustment that they want to fix for each year. Now, if you look at this budget, what the budget has done is to fix the adjustment to 15% for 2022. You, you said what, what adjustment? The fees and charges. Uh, individual entities are not able, they do not have the liberty to fix so fees. They, they, they come up with their own proposals, and they send it to the ministry, look at it, and send it to parliament for approval. This time, the government is making the adjustment to at 15%. No. In other words, you cannot go above 15%. But before you even send it to the finance minister to look at it, you make sure it's within the 15%. And then on an annual basis, it's supposed to be charged Again, uh, again, again, the fifteen percent, the the fifteen percent is is minimum, isn't it? Is the average? Is the average? So average, it's yes. it's not the cap. Let's read it. Well, it's not the cap. Frankly, it sounded like cap. Unless uh, I got it wrong. The same argument. I see. Yes, it sounded okay. like a cap. To okay, me. so that's that's good news for you. Let's let's speak to. Okay, let me let me hear John Ewa, uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Bank uh, Ghana Bank As Association of Banks. Thank you for joining us. Uh, the finance sector. Um, what do you say about this budget? It looks like um, you have to readjust the number of things, right? Yes, uh, just like other economic entities um, in the country, banks will also have to do a little bit of readjustment. Okay. But um, before I start, uh, I would I'm just want to. Um, send our appreciation to the minister for the level of consultation that we had uh, with the ministry before this 2022 budget came out and we really appreciate the gesture and the extension of arms so we can have um, our input even if they were not in the end carried in the final budget statement mm -hmm. the the mere essence of um, being part of the pro touched on but um, uh, even if we use the entire program to talk about the debt levels, I think it will be time well spent. Mm. Uh, as, a, as a country, uh, you know, we plan to always spend more than what we generate. And the unfortunate situation is what we plan to spend on. If you pick the various line items, you see that they are more or less all fixed expenditures. What it means is, when we say we are spending or we, we, we want to spend X in 2022, we are almost certain that X will be spent in 2022. Unfortunately, what we plan to generate, uh, there is always uh, a problem with the revenue generation capacity and our ability to mop in as much as uh, we always plan. So uh, to that extent, I, I think as a country, we need to drill down further and further on the things we spend our money on. And it goes down again to the issue around value for money and government procurement. And uh, we, we will be excited at a time where we see that because of the volume of uh, the government business or volume of flows within the government procurement arena, government is able to procure services 
at prices lower than what John Lerua as a private citizen would procure. Be otherwise, we will always be talking about new taxes and fresh revenue generation if the bas basket that is holding the revenue uh, is, uh, is leaking in terms of value for money. We need, as a country, to really open our eyes um, in ensuring that the basket of items that we spend our money on are uh, items that are well spent, and we can always follow the money and know where uh, uh, our revenues have been uh, expended. Th that is by way of an introductory remark for me. But uh, as a, a banking industry, we did not, uh, uh, in 2022, we have decided that we want to be part of the solution. As a country, we've been talking and talking. And, so uh, you, you find in the budget that the minister talked about skills development training uh, and youth entrepreneurial development and banks have decided to be at the center of this policy initiative. Uh, as an industry, we ourselves are going to spend upwards of 75 million Ghana cities over a three year period to help train over 150,000 young graduates and youth entrepreneurs so they can gather some skills, basic skills that enables them to transition from school into the job market. So this is Again, your own. This is your own ini initiative, independent of this budget. Yes, this is our own initiative. But of course, there was some background discussions with, uh, with the ministry, and that is how it found its way into the uh, the 2022 budget. So what you are talking about will come under the U start. Uh, the the fine details are still some fit that uh, truncates is uh, a rollout. The portion that the banks have committed to doing will definitely run, whether there is you uh, uh, that program running or that program doesn't even run at all. Yeah, so, one hundred fifty thousand youth, yeah, so, young graduates, and mm. youth what, entrepreneurs. What, what will be special about what you are talking about? Because uh, I think people's major concern is that it's difficult to survive uh, using a bank loan to to grow a business, uh, particularly I'm, I'm, startups. I'm, and, and it is not a Ghana-specific problem. When people talk about that, we make it a Ghana problem. It is a worldwide problem. It's a global phenomenon. You cannot run a startup with debt and debt and debt. You need patient capital. And what we need to build, the capacity you need to build in this country is venture capital specifically to venture into these startups, small businesses, to help propel them up into levels where they can sustain debt. If you start a business thinking of the bank loan as your first point of call, um, more or less you are going to start a business that will have a stunted growth because from a few months into your startup, you'll be thinking about, instead of thinking about business growth, you'll be thinking about uh, um, loan repayment. And we do not think that the emphasis should be uh, uh, how much I'll get from the bank per se, or at what rate. But how, how can we venture into small businesses can have access? And when government designed these programs to, to help the youth start off, how do we make the process transparent enough so that anybody sitting anywhere who has a program that uh, qualifies to be part of whatever initiative of state is going on um, can have a justifiable reason that uh, their program, their program, mm. or their uh, 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 project okay. will not suffer a bit of uh, a breakdown along we, the way. We, we, so, as funds, we yeah. enjoy the sustainability mm. of, our, of our practice. Our okay, process. let's hear briefly from uh, Professor Solomon Nunu, uh, UTAC National President and Dean, Office of Research, Innovation, and Consultancy, UMAT, Takwa. Um, were your expectations met in this uh, budget? Uh, what specifics are there? Uh, that gives you, you know, that makes you smile, if at all. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think in terms of smiling, um, you may talk a little bit about uh, some few things happening in the tertiary education space. So we made a framework for tertiary institutions in the country, found in paragraph 955. And I think it's a good thing that may help and also help ginger or encourage the sector to grow as far as, as much as possible. Also, the fact that um, the Labor Act also has been talked about that is going to start for review. We believe that some few bottlenecks that sometimes uh, the devil labor can also come up for discussion, and that also would help us. 
But beyond um, this, we've also had a number of challenges. And basically, it, I'll sum up with what uh, we form part of the former sector. And uh, unfortunately, um, the former sector happens to be part of the 800,000 paying the, all the taxes that seem to be doing the work in the country. So um, <clears throat> it's always about taxes from one form or the other. Your salary is taxed, income tax of 25% will hit you after you pay 175 for anything you purchase. And now if you decide to transfer money to your mother in the village, you are now being told that you need to uh, pay 1.75% on it. And so right. that is very discouraging for us. And uh, we felt there should have been better consultations on some of these things before. We, we, um, we are going to move the... into that specific right after a, a, a short break on that. So you, you'll have your take on that. Okay. Right. So, yes, so if you talk about the Labor Act and you're happy that it's up for uh, some review, for me, this is not the first time I'm hearing that the Labor Act is up for some review. Uh, soon after it was passed in 2003, we began to hear that some things were, you know, uh, providers of education. Uh, as providers of education, uh I don't know if you have had the chance of looking at issues about um, the quota they expect us to generate. Quota they expect us to generate year in, year out, um, budgets um, state how much we should generate, and it's not possible. Why is it not possible in terms of fees and charges that we can do? Um, from 2016 up to 2020, um, tertiary institutions were not allowed to adjust the figures until 2020 when we're allowed to person is paying um, for those in the sciences it's around 530 ghana cities so other charges may come and add to it and that would increase it a little bit maybe to less than 2000 cities for the whole year so you'll notice that aside government paying in only salaries of university teachers uh, when it comes to all others that you expect to improve upon um, the working conditions of the teacher, it's not forthcoming. And that is very discouraging for us. Mm. And also, you'll see that oftentimes we are getting acts and bills being passed, and sometimes you send your um, inputs and no one seems to hear you. Um, you look at the budget on GIL and NAFTI in Japan University. As we talk today, it's difficult to even form the councils for this, for us to even look at the amalgamated council, how it's going to look at, how it's going to look like. These are problems that normally would come up and you don't see what um, government is doing. And mm -hmm. often it's all about the issue of consultation. Not much consultation goes on into coming up with some of these um, ideas. All right. Um, maybe I, I get a minute of your view on this matter uh, in this area of education, because reading um, uh, paragraph uh, 1072, that's page 202, uh, they talk about the, the problem with the law school. And the minister says that in 2022, the Ghana Law School expects to conduct entrance exams for 2,500 applicants. That's the estimation that it has. Mm -hmm. And then it anticipates to admit 800 students into the school, while 700 students are expected to be called to the bar. I, I don't know how, what kind of magic this is. Um, there's, there's a huge backlog down, but there are not clear timelines as to when they are starting school. And then if we go into the next year, that is 499 waiting, and then how much are you going to admit and all of that. Now, you have an exam that will determine the number of qualified students. And you are already predetermined. How, how does this work? Are you, are you concerned about it or you are removed from the law school issues? Um, no, I think um, this is an issue that actually needs a lot of discussion. And it doesn't only talk, it's not only about um, the law school. You can even go as far back as the BEC. You can go into how they even do the selection and allocation of scores. Mm. Um, I don't know. You can check, but when it, talk, it comes to BEC, the number of people who will get a one in a subject or two or a three are determined by percentages and not by a certain cut of mark. 
And that is problematic. And it's the same thing we seem to be seeing happening in the law schools. I think it's better that we start at various universities that have the capacity to be given licenses to train people so that they can do that on their own. Yeah, that's they that's that's be actually been that's actually been one of the most feasible ideas on the on the drawing board. And the the supervisors of this realm appear to mm -hmm. suggest this is where we have to go because the building that they are seeking to put up, the superstructure to mm -hmm. admit, you know, as in the good numbers, it's still at foundation stage. They've actually not laid the foundation, as we see. Or what is it? They are doing the uh, forgotten what you you talk about that. Now, when the expectation is that next year at least there will be a radical shift, you now have you know an announcement that says we will examine uh, this number and we'll pick out this number. Start thinking from what it is at the moment, because currently you go to lots of villages in this country and there are no lawyers who give legal advice to people. So even how many are we having in the public sector who are mm. giving the legal right. aid mm. um, to people? So these are all issues that shows us that um, being a lawyer, which um, I thought to seem to be something, a prestigious a profession, we need to start looking at it that we need to open it up and mm. allow more people so that we make legal services available to the masses than what it is at the moment. And I think okay. the earlier we start thinking about the licensing and do something concrete that will help implement it, the better mm. for all of us. Okay, thank you very much. And you have also talked about the fees regime stuff because the law school, it costs uh, 15,600 for tuition per year. Um, yes, John. Let me get you briefly yes. uh, pick on a few of the things that yes. they mentioned. Then we'll take a break. Yes. We'll return to look 21. In fact, in the budget, we estimated to do 9.5. We actually are achieving 9.4. But this is below the line reporting. So when you add, you bring the above the line reporting, including the FinSec and the energy sector, the contingent liabilities, you hit the 12.1. So just to clarify that, we are within the deficit target for 2021. But in 2022, we are doing the above the line reporting and everything inclusive at 7.4%. Uh, John, in his uh, contribution, said that primary balance, the surplus is achieved through the zero bonds that we... No, no, I didn't say that. Please. You didn't say that. Easy. Okay, then I won't go Please. there. But he talked about election-related expenditures. Is it's okay. He said he didn't yeah. go there. So I've retracted it's not that. Just because we want this to be yes. very brief. Yes, yeah. let no it be brief. Then, we then he on. says that election-related expenditure in 2012, which was an election year, in fact, to identify election-related expenditure in any budget, you look out for the goods and services. That's where the expenditure is. Yeah. In 2012, the NDC government at the time projected to spend 967 million. The actual outturn was 1.3 billion in that election year. They were spent by 36%. In 2016, they projected to spend 2.5 billion. The actual outturn was 3.2 billion. They were spent by 51.4%. In 2020, which is what they, he keeps referring to, NPP government projected to spend 8.3 billion. The actual expenditure was 7.3 billion. So we actually underspent our goods and services by 11.3 percent, negative 11.3 percent. So they did a, a expenditure because of elections. Now the Obatan Parkes. They refer to some of the expenditure that was for COVID, that was veiled as for COVID, but intended to attract votes. Well, but they should be specific and tell us. If they say that we have spent because of elections, where is the data? Mm. They have to prove okay, that so because the elections data do not support that. Them quickly. Can on you the do a yes, I mean, I'll be very brief. On the Obatan Parkes, government wants to spend about 100 billion cities in the medium term in the Obatan Parkes. As we speak, out of that, we are getting a new start program, which is seeking to spend about 10 billion cities even in this budget. In, in collaboration with the banks as well. You start? You start, yes. What's the, the budget is one billion. Yeah, one billion is quoted for what government's contribution is giving this year and every year. But there are other contributions from our development partners, which will add up to five billion. 
and then the banking particip the participating banks in the private sector are also raising five billion. The, the finance minister didn't give us. It's all in the budget, please. Really? Yes. Okay. It's all in the budget. Mm. These are not figures I'm calculating. You can read. I, I may not have it here, but read yeah, it. I, I highlighted Go to the USTAT, Yes. I, I highlighted. Yes, it's five one. billion. Five, uh, Ten billion allocation on the USTAT. Mm. And, and so when you put all this together, and various ministries was talking about um, the ministry, ministry of tourism. Mm. In fact, I'm aware that under the uh, Ghana Case of Batampa program, Ministry of Tourism is uh, supporting uh, uh, some hotels mm. with uh, some uh, World Bank financing of about $20 million. And some are getting, I know a hotel in my constituency which has received an allocation of $20,000 mm. and several others. Yes, I, I, you, the hotelier president is online, you can ask. Okay. So a lot is happening under right. the Ministry of Agriculture right. among the rest. All right. Then finally, uh, uh, I think uh, there was a very important point that was made about the big elephant in the room. How is government addressing the question of expenditure when our revenues are suffering? So if you look at the 2021 budget, we estimated to raise 57 billion, but we are doing fifteen reduced from 113 billion to 211 billion. So if we cannot raise, we will not spend. That is the fiscal discipline we are talking about. That okay. we have to stay within our right. means Thank and you. make sure that Thank we you. reduce yes. our debt yes, John, quickly. Um, what issues do you need to clarify? Quickly, I asked the we're taking question. a break. Yeah, because you you were dwelling on the issue of a bad temper case. And I asked the minister, how much have you spent? How many jobs have you created? We are not interested in what you intend to do with the banks. We can look at that. I'm saying that we didn't. Yes. Please. There are something that says that we should always allow the flow. <laughs> oh, yeah. The other <laughs> issue is that. <laughs> He's aware that he was interjecting you. <laughs> oh, uh, no, don't mind uh, yes. <laughs> As for The John, other issue my brother, so. is <laughs> Q3. <laughs> you see, we look at our times before we look at projects. What's Q3? Quarter 3. Okay. They projected that they will collect a revenue amount of 51.3 billion. They collected only 47. There's a shortfall of 4.1 billion. Check from your budget. This is the out 10 for your quarter 3. You've missed that target by 4.1 billion. Despite all these revenue streams, they're not above the line. Something. Your interest is what is the overall? Is that not the case? <laughs> because that is the issue. Is overall. The overall is 12.1. Yes, that's above the line reporting. Wait, let me tell you. Anything. Wait, don't bring yes. above the line here because viewers Why? are not. Can I Why? make my that's point? That's how it's can presented. I... Where? Where? Yeah? Which country In the does budget. that? Which country does that? Every tell country me. does that. So, the... something. The overall deficit yeah. is 12.1 percent. No debate about that. That's the okay. overall deficit yeah, of that, Ghana. But that's yeah. what we have. Representing an amount of 37 billion. Mm. That's what we have. Already, you are collecting money to pay for the energy sector yeah. section, which is the energy sector recovery levy. You've, uh, you've, you've taxed us to pay for that. You've also taxed us to pay for the financial sector cleanup. And when we talk of a fiscal deficit, we are talking of within the year, you are reporting above the line and below the line. Okay. When you are collecting these revenues, you should have paid those monies. The final issue is there something. This economy, we are in serious crisis. If the minister says that we are in difficult times, Yes, everybody agrees that the whole uh, world we are in difficult times. Please the Ghana's situation mm. is exceptional. Is it true or not that in the peers, amongst our midst in sub-Saharan Africa, Ghana appears to be performing the worst when it comes to debt management? Look at the euro bond. We borrowed 13 billion between John Mahama, Kufuo, and Ata Mills. They borrowed 4 billion. President Kufuado has borrowed over 10 billion to show for it. So something clearly, if you look at where we were, because we started with Ghana beyond it. Was that not the mantra? Mm -hmm. That in three years, we'll move Ghana from dependency on some other countries so that we are self-dependent. Today, look at Ghana state. A very sorrowful and poor state. All right. That is All the right. state of Ghana. Thank you, Thank you John Abdullahi Jinapo. And you have been watching and listening to news file this is your most authoritative news analysis platform and my guests have been dr john 
Ampuntia Kuma, who is MP at Jusso and Deputy Finance Minister, Economist and Political Risk Analyst. We've been hearing from uh, representatives of various uh, sectors of the economy. Sir Chuma Kwabwa uh, represents the AGI, the Association of Ghana Industries. He's the Chief Executive, Dr. Edward Aka Nyamike is junior, is president, Ghana Hotels Association and MD of Venaco Lodge. Professor Solomon Nunu, UTAC National President and Dean Office of Research, Innovation and Consultancy, UMAT Takwa, and John Ewa, Chief Executive Officer of the Ghana Association of Banks. When we return, one issue that is troubling you a lot, and you have sent in loads of messages already, is the e-levy. We'll deal with it. <laughs> 